Jane Austen, right? You've probably heard of her. She is a very influential and popular writer of romantic novels. And pretty much all of her books have been converted into kind of big name movies, um, you know, even though they were published in the early 19th century, right? Because her kind of ability to create these really relatable characters and her really amazing sense of humor, like she's got a perfect eye for social comedy. It really is something that still resonates with, you know, readers and viewers today. It's all, you know, it's all still pretty relevant. Um, you know, and, and, and in a lot of ways, right, her, her books are kind of, kind of the proto-romantic comedies, right? So even, I mean, her actual plots are made into movies, but also like a lot of, you know, the rom-coms that you're familiar with are, you know, if not based on Austen, certainly owe a lot to Austen. You know, the meet, the meet cute, hate each other, come together at the end, that's totally a Jane Austen original plot that's been done to death now, but back when she did it was, you know, kind of original. There was even actually a novel published in 2004, which was then made into a movie, about people reading Jane Austen novels called the Jane Austen Book Club. So you can see, like, we really love some Jane Austen. It's, it's, it's good stuff. We still relate to it. But, you know, for someone who's so kind of, you know, omnipresent in a lot of ways and so famous, we actually don't know that much about Jane Austen because she was kind of, you know, a little bit of a mysterious figure. Um, and, a and part of the reason for this is that her sister Cassandra actually burned a lot of her letters. Um, theory is that Cassandra thought that the letters would make Jane look bad. We don't really know. Um, <laughs> I mean, literary letters often do make the writers kind of look bad, but sometimes in really entertaining ways, like James Joyce wrote some really, really dirty letters to his wife that are look those up. You can just Google it. Um, so maybe Jane Austen's letters were dirty sex letters. We'll never know. And actually, you know, Cassandra burning them probably has led us to think a little more creatively about what might be in them and extrapolate further and worse than what they probably were. Um, you know, but like w w the things that we do know are that, you know, like many of the characters in her novels, Jane Austen grew up in a house kind of wealthy enough you know, not to be poor, but poor enough not to be wealthy, kind of in that awkward middle place. Um, and, and a lot of her novels really focus on, you know, the fact that women who weren't born into, you know, extreme wealth have to basically are obligated to marry well in order to get any kind of independence from their family um, or to have any kind of, you know, money of their own to spend. And, um, but, you know, even though all of Jane Austen's books are about marriage, actually she, um, neither she nor her sister Cassandra ever married, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, Austen, Austen writes about marriage in a way that clearly is saying something about how, right, y you don't have a lot of options as, you know, as, as a woman in her time. And, you know, her, her kind of take on marriage is, is that, that it's sort of something that you do and something that can be beneficial in a lot of ways, but that, you know, it, it's not something to be happy about. And that might explain a bit why she, who was a successful author, didn't end up marrying because she was able to sort of, you know, make her own way a bit. Um, you know, it, and it's interesting, actually, right, that she was writing at a time when really marriage was absolutely expected. Like, that was the only thing that you could do as a woman. Now, right, all of these sort of, you know, books and movies and things that are based on kind of the romantic comedy plot lines that she laid out, right now we live in a time where you're not forced into marriage, and yet all of those things still end in, if not marriage, you know, the two characters getting together. So it's a little, you know, it's a little funny when you look at it that way, that she was writing something that was reflective over time, and, you know, in marriage is almost a business proposition in a lot of, in a lot of cases. And we've kind of taken that and even further romanticized it, made it into something that is not necessary but still greatly desired. So we've kind of, you know, taken it out of context a bit with the way that we interpret her now. You know, but how did she, so I said a little bit about her family. How did she get to be writing? That's sort of, you know, the next logical question. Um, right? she's, you know, she's born in 1775 in, in Steventon, England. And, you know, she's one of eight children, six brothers and the aforementioned Cassandra who burned all of her letters. And Austin's parents were really good about sort of encouraging her love of reading and writing. You know, she was, she had a sharp wit. That was really apparent right from the beginning. They saw that and, and nurtured it, which is what parents should do, right? Nurture your children's talents. Um, <laughs> you might, kid might turn into Jane Austen. 
And, um, and, and it seemed to them, or something that they noticed right away is that she loved, loved, loved making fun of, you know, the establishment, right? Social laws, social rules. That was sort of her real gift was for kind of skewering, <laughs> skewering social mores. And, um, you know, out, outside of her writing, she, you know, her life really wasn't all that dissimilar to a character in her books, right? She played the piano, she sewed, she danced at balls. You know, she was kind of your typical, you know, well cultured lady or, you know, accomplished is the word that, that, that they use to describe women like that. They have accomplishments, which are you know, piano sewing, et cetera, things like that. But she, you know, she, would, she, she really was, uh, in a lot of ways, a writer who wrote what she knew with the, you know, exception of the whole not marrying thing. Although actually, to be fair, we don't see a lot of her characters in marriages. We see them sort of going towards marriages. So perhaps she did actually still, you know, have uh, familiarity with that. And, you know, she, Austin scholars kind of speculate, right, in, in the same vein of writing what you know and kind of writing for entertainment to, you know, skewer the establishment. They kind of think that she started out writing to amuse her friends and family, right? And she didn't actually decide to be professional until probably around 1789. And it would actually be kind of great. I mean, I wish I had a friend like Austin, you know, writing to entertain me or doing, you know, <laughs> instead of some of the friends that I have who you have to kind of encourage them in their creative projects. Right, Austin was actually had, had something going on, had real talent. And her first attempt at sort of a thing to publish was a shorter novel called Lady Susan, which is totally unlike the work that she's famous for and you've like probably not heard of at all before this lesson. But it's it's really cool. It's worth checking out and it's interesting because it's it's very different in a lot of ways. It's about a mid 30s uh, uh, a woman in her mid 30s who's a widow who's kind of scheming to get a new husband and she's she's attractive um but she's also really selfish and she's not very moral, which is kind of a, a little bit of a deviation for Austin. And you know, she's, but she's witty, which is an Austin staple. So it's kind of this, you know, interesting, she's not moral, but she's also witty. So she's sort of a weird hodgepodge. Um, and, and so that's kind of, it's an interesting first attempt um, at, at a work. And it's just, you know, worth checking out for that reason. Her most, she's most widely associated, though, with six major novels and, of course, their respective film, ad film adaptations. Sense and Sensibility in 1811, um, first published work, it focuses on the limitations of women's options due to the circumstances of their birth, which is sounding very familiar now that we know something more about her. Got an older sister, Eleanor Dashwood, who is totally ruled by her head, and a younger sister, Marianne, who is motivated by her heart. Each sister thinks that the other one is like totally doesn't know what she's doing and that it would be better if she did it her way. They get what they want when they start acting more like each other. What they want is, of course, husbands. And Eleanor ends up with a guy named Edward Ferrars and Marianne with Colonel Brandon. Next, we get Pride and Prejudice, 1813. And this is probably the most famous Jane Austen novel. Um, it was first called First Impressions. First called First Impressions. Um, and it, because it's about two people, right, Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy, who initially don't like each other very much. And, you know, but spoiler alert, I think you probably know how it ends. They end up falling in love. This is really the ultimate romantic comedy. We have a whole video on it. Watch that to learn more. Mansfield Park, 1814, is often kind of the least favorite of Austin, you know, of people who love Austin, Austin fans, probably because the heroine Fanny Price is kind of boring. She's, <laughs> you know, and, and liked way too many Austin characters, she ends up marrying her cousin, which is kind of, I guess, a thing they did back then. And she's from a relatively poor family, but she ends up being raised by her rich aunt and uncle as well as, and, and with her cousin. So that's kind of how, that's who Fanny is. We've got Emma in 1815, which if you've seen the movie Clueless, you will know the story very well. Rolling with the homies. You know, wealthy, beautiful, if kind of slightly misguided, Emma Woodhouse is always trying to set up her friends with kind of often disastrous results while never realizing that her sort of brother-in-law, brother Paul Rudd in the movie, has been in love with her since she was 13. There's so many inappropriate family relationships in Austin. It's unbelievable. And then they were all kind of seen as really romantic. And we don't, that's uh, something that's lost in the modern adaptations. We don't usually have people falling in love with their cousins. That scene is a little too, uh. Um, and then we get Northanger Abbey is published in 1818, which is actually after her death. So that's a posthumous publication. And this one I, has, you know, kind of all the hallmarks of an Austen novel. We've got 
a plucky heroine named Catherine Moreland, a grand estate, um, the titular Northanger Abbey, and kind of a complicated romance, but there's also this sort of fun, spooky element to it. Um, it's kind of in competition <laughs> with Mansfield Park for the least well-known and kind of least loved um, you know, work of Austen. But it's actually kind of fun, and it sort of explores the act of reading in itself, you know, act of reading novels in addition to being a novel itself. So it's a little bit kind of a meta thing. You know, Catherine's reading The Mysteries of Adolfo, which is a gothic novel by Anne Radcliffe, and kind of expects Northanger Abbey to, to be like that. And then we get Persuasion, which is also in 1818, also posthumously. And, you know, like the title might indicate, Persuasion kind of explores what happens when someone acts under the influence of somebody else instead of making her own decisions. Um, so in this case, we've got sort of smart, smart but weak-willed Anne Elliot talked out of a marriage that she wants with Frederick Wentworth, who's kind of a classy but, uh, you know, unfortunately poor naval officer. Um, she's talked out of it by her family and her close friend and is really unhappy because of it. They do get together in the end because it is Austin. These are comedies, not tragedies. Um, and, but that's sort of, you know, the, the, the point is that you might get swayed by people and that's not a great thing. Quick, that's a quick summary of Jane Austen and her works. Um, and you can, you can really pick her out if you kind of wanted an overarching sense of what her prose is like. You look for witty heroines and you look for kind of sparkling, clean prose and, you know, often kind of, you know, humor that's aimed at, you know, making fun of sort of social, you know, conventions, things like that. Um, stories are still read today, uses the basis of, you know, many romantic comedies, like, like Clueless is based on Emma. And, you know, besides being adapted for film all the time, they're just, they're just good. They're just good and relatable. And, and the important thing to remember is that Austen herself never married, even though all of her books are about marriage. So, yeah.